I'd like you to imagine that you and I have been given permission to do some reconnaissance and footprinting of an organization. So we've got all of our permission slips and authorizations signed by the right people. And then the question is, what exactly are we going to be looking for? And what are some of the methods that we could use to collect the information about the potential target? Well, my friend, that's exactly what we're going to discuss in this nugget. Footprinting is the very first step of an attack on a system whether that's a network or a host or a server. And that's where the attacker is gonna gather publicly available information. And the cool thing about getting it from public sources is that it's a passive type of an attack. We're gathering information and the target really doesn't even know yet that we're even interested in them. So the footprinting process, as we gather information, it's gonna allow us to narrow the scope. For example, if we know the range of IP addresses that their hosts and servers are using, or if we know the type of operating system that they're running on their servers, and we know their domain names that they're managing, that allows us to reduce our focus area. For example, if we know that they do not have any Linux systems at all, we don't need to worry about trying any tools that can take advantage of vulnerabilities in Linux systems. But what we can do, if we know they're running version XYZ of some operating system, if there's known vulnerabilities with those types of systems, those become prime targets then that we could use exploits on to compromise those systems. Also, as we gather and learn information, we're gonna to wanna to document what their network quote unquote looks like, at least from a logical perspective. Let's start off with search engines, a fantastic way to do footprinting and reconnaissance because using a search engine is passive. We're not directly interacting with the target. We're simply gathering information about that target and we can learn things like the technology platforms, employee details, login pages, internet portals, and so forth. There's also some amazing archives. Let's say, for example, we know that there was a web page 12 months ago that has some details and they've modified the site since then. Well, the internet, once somebody pushes content out to the internet, there's a whole bunch of caching going on and we can use cache engines if we needed some information or data from that site as it existed 12 months ago. There's also web-based services that can tell us what the operating system is of that company's servers without us ever directly going to those servers. We can also find location information, including beautiful maps and satellite images of the physical locations of our potential target. We can also leverage people searches. For example, we can get information regarding residential addresses and email addresses, contact numbers, date of birth, and a whole host of other information that might be useful as we continue our reconnaissance, footprinting, and eventually the attack. We can also gather information from financial services as well that have details about the company, the market value of a company's shares, the competitive details or advantages of that company, the company profile, and more. We can also do searching on job sites. Now that may not seem like an obvious one, but if a company is hiring for Java programmers or for .NET, or they need an administrator for Novell, what is it, GroupWise from many, many years ago, or Exchange, or they want a server administrator who understands Windows 2003 or some older technology, those are dead giveaways that they're actually using those technologies. So footprinting through job sites can also be useful as we gather intelligence on the target. We can also gather information from groups or forums or blogs that are common or associated or produced by the target. Now, to kick the searching up a notch, we can also use Google hacking. Now, Google hacking does not refer to hacking Google. It simply refers to using some very cool arguments along with our Google searches. If we know there's a vulnerability with a certain type of login to a certain system, and there's always a certain type of URL involved, we can do an advanced Google search and Google will deliver right to our doorstep a list of all the sites that currently have that string that we're looking for. And if we wanted to narrow it down further, for example, we're looking for that string and also at that site referring to our target, it'd be very easy for Google to hand that to us as well. And social networking, oh my goodness, what a boon to the hacker. All that information just freely available. So an attacker could, number one, just look at the social media because many users just simply put everything out there. And for an individual who has some security settings on their social media, which is a good idea, by the way, the attacker might do some social engineering to trick a user into becoming friends and having a connection with them. And that may happen over weeks or months. So maybe the target is a big fan of fishing and all of a sudden the attacker is a huge fishing fan, does some research, they join a common group, and as a result, they have a few chats back and forth, and then they become friends. So that may involve the attacker creating a fake profile and then using the information gained from that for some future attack. Another option that exists to us is the company's website or sites themselves, where we can monitor and analyze their website. 
And by doing so, we might be able to gather the software they're using, what version they're using, the operating system they're using, the folders and subfolders they're using, possibly the scripting platform, and other details that we could then possibly use as part of an attack. Another aspect of a company's website is that we could actually look at the HTML source content. And it's often surprising what is revealed inside of the HTML source. For example, there could be comments from the developer, which might include the contact information of that developer or possibly the contact information for the administrator. It could reveal the file system structure and the type of scripting they're doing. And if customers are visiting that website and the website is using cookies, analyzing the cookies that are left on the client computer could also help give an insight as to how their website is operating. Another great source of information is email. And it's amazing what we can extract just by looking at the header of an email message. We can have the address from where it was sent, the sender's IP address, the sender's mail server. We can get information about the authentication mechanism being used. We can get the sender's full name and a bunch of other details, which can be useful, not only for the benefit of possibly using email as an attack vector, but also just the raw information that's available in that header, including names, IP addresses, and so forth. We can also gather information about our target through competitive intelligence, which is available. And by using that information, we can identify, analyze, and verify information about the competitors, for example, of that company. And one of the benefits of competitive information is the people who are providing that are not really expecting it to be a hacker or an attacker who's gathering that information for the purposes of a compromise of the target. Because it could just be another company who wants to go into that space and wants to know information about the existing competition in that space. And besides companies that specifically provide competitive information, we could also get it from the company website itself, press releases, trade journals, if the company has patents or trademarks, or if they publish customer testimonials or vendor interviews. Those are all sources for competitive information that might be leveraged or used as part of information gathering and footprinting. Another really amazing tool is Whois, which gives us domain name details, domain name servers, when the domain was created, contact details regarding the owner of the domain. And that information is going to be useful for several reasons, including perhaps when we do a scan of the network, we'll know the IP address range. Or if we're going to do social engineering, the manipulation of users and people as a method of attack and compromise, having the information about who the domain administrator is could be very, very helpful. Another great tool is our good friend DNS, which does name resolution. And in addition to that, an attacker could use that to determine the key host in the network by looking at the various record types that are available in DNS. For example, A records or quad A records or MX records, where the MX record is referring to a mail exchange server, which may be a potential vector for an attack. And once DNS has helped us in identifying the IP addresses of various devices, we could use additional tools to learn about their network. For example, a simple tool like Traceroute and many similar tools like Traceroute that have the ability to get by firewalls that would otherwise block traditional Traceroute. And that gives us a little bit more potential to find more information about their network topology, at least from the outside and potentially to the DMZ. And the last piece I wanna share with you regarding footprinting is social engineering. And basically we're exploiting human behavior for our own benefit. For example, in the case of a hacker to get confidential information that otherwise shouldn't be released or revealed, or getting a user to click on something or do something that would give us a vector or a path into the system. And if social engineering is done well and correctly, the person being socially engineered is not even aware that it happened. So some of the things that might be attempted to be gained through social engineering could include usernames and passwords, what security products are being used at the company. Is it Palo Alto? Is it Checkpoint? Is it ASA? What operating systems are they using? What's the network layout? What are the IP addresses and or names of some of the servers in their company? And the best way to protect a company or an organization against social engineering is to have employee training and periodic verification. I'm glad you joined me for this nugget. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.